Hello, hi, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Hey, can you hear me on uh, the stream? Okay, can you see me on the stream? If, if, uh, oh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, okay. So it's really delayed. Okay, no problem. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the first ISS sessions of uh, the summer semester. Um, I'm really happy. Uh, thanks for Luai for the introduction. I'm really happy to be the president and, uh, you know, lead this team. Oh. Okay. Sorry, Luai's Discord just hit me. Um, uh, yeah, on, on that point, if there are any issues with the stream, um, please use the questions channel to uh, uh, let us know. I'll be browsing that the entire time. Um, also, if you have any questions about the um, segments, so including this introduction, uh, please feel free. Sorry, I need to mute this card because it's confusing. Okay. Um, so if you have any questions about this segment or any segments after this, uh, please use the questions channel. It's under the stream category in Discord. And um, feel free to post your comments in there as well. Uh, I'll be browsing that, uh, looking for feedback. Um, also, I was going to say use your mic to ask questions, but uh, the delay is kind of making it a difficult. So maybe don't use your mic to ask questions. Um, please use the uh, Discord channel. Um, I will actually ping you guys just to make sure that you see it. Ooh, there you go. Okay. So um, Lou, I already introduced, introduced the new team, but I, I want to just say, to be honest, I don't think we should get too hung up on the titles of who's doing on the team because all members have shown like a lot of interest in helping with activities that are outside of their designated like normal role duties so i'd say like on top of that as well we have many members of the community that are outside of the executive team that also help make is sessions a reality uh, namely like this week and many weeks after we will have nick and adam doing the news and nick doing the reaper rundown so like you know we thank them for their contributions um, uh, that being said, our executive, team, our executive team does have two main goals that I'd like to talk about. The first goal being growing the community. Um, it's really important that uh, we implement good onboarding for new students or possibly implement changes to help entice current students that do not attend uh, current ISS sessions. Um, and the second goal is developing a better in community engagement. Um, I think building a bigger community is one thing, but keeping uh, more members engaged is uh, is also a challenge that we're you know we're looking to take on. Um, currently, we don't have any concrete plans to announce for how to accomplish these goals, but I thought I'd give you guys all a an idea of what we're about and where we're heading. Um, and by the way, we do have a segment later tonight called uh, Brainstorm Fiesta. I'm sorry, I'm just reading questions to make sure everything's good. Okay. Um, so we have a segment later tonight called Brainstorm Fiesta. I hope as many people as possible can engage with that activity. I think it'll be a great way to get new ideas and it's going to be a lot of fun. It's, you might not be what you expect is what I'm going to say. Um, I would also like to mention that, you know, it means a lot that you guys chose to come and participate in these meetings. I know the current pandemic is not really conducive to like good vibes, but I hope that ISS, ISS, sorry, IS sessions is something positive that you can look forward to and uh, enjoy, you know, throughout the months over the coming months, at least. Um, also to note, the CESB has recently been made available for students. Um, if you did not qualify for CERB, I would recommend that you check if you qualify for CESB and uh, apply. Um, it could help you once, it could help you a lot. Um, so, yep, that's all for me. Once again, thank you for coming. I'm gonna hand it off to Nick and Adam with the news. So hopefully the stream doesn't take too long to catch up to them.
Hey, thanks. Um, yeah, so Adam, are you there? Oh, awesome. Cool. Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome back to the news. We're just waiting for uh, Adam to hop into the uh, voice stream, which I think he will be in a second. So you know what? I will. Are you there? Sweet. Hi, boy. Awesome. I just turned on my mic. Yeah, I just turned on my mic. So, okay, uh, you got the first uh, news story, so uh, go for it. Thanks for coming. Okay, sure. Uh, sorry. So, Oracle has issued an advisory to uh, for customers to quickly uh, patch their WebLogic servers. Um, so, those who are not familiar, um, WebLogic is... Um, is an alternative to like Tomcat and JBoss, um, but it's more more geared towards enterprises. Um, and so the vulnerability there has been uh, multiple vulnerabilities that actually have been patched recently by Microsoft, um, but customers have not applied those patches. Uh, the tricky thing about uh, WebLogic that that the article notes is that uh, WebLogic, as we've worked with with like Tomcat in um, in our uh, uh, Java Enterprise classes, um, we end up cust uh, users end up customizing their web s web logic servers or Tomcat servers. So it's patching is quite challenging sometimes, but uh, in any case, it's still important to patch. Uh, the vulnerabilities uh, that have been discovered that Oracle uh, is advising customers to patch is uh, Java serialization. So this has been an issue of j that's been plaguing Java for quite a while now um, so it's definitely and so yeah it's quite severe and I think the next one's here is too also someone was saying if you can if you could just turn up your mic a little bit or maybe just speak a little bit closer to your microphone yeah, no worries. Sure. Uh, hopefully uh, we don't get too much popping I moved it up Okay, uh, so uh, for so the next article is about Zoom. No, it's the, v uh, so it, Zoom it's the VPN their, concerns uh, one. End-to-end -end encryption to for Zoom boomers. Uh, oh, my, my apologies. So the VPN concerns one. So uh, a lot of organizations, as we've seen, have been shifting uh, the majority of their workforce or all their workforce uh, to using VPN. Um, it used to be that companies is in land networks And uh, just even when they were building out their VPN solutions uh, for remote workers, it was just a small portion uh, of employees that were expected to use the VPN at any one time. Uh, so basically the article just kind of lists um, uh, three kind of th lessons learned. So uh, one is that uh, due to the heavy reliance on VPN products because of remote work, um, VPN products are being uh, uh, scoured much more uh, frequently to look for vulnerabilities and vulnerabilities are being discovered at a much faster pace than uh, usual so definitely um, patch your VPN servers uh, frequently uh, and also don't use default uh, settings make sure that you harden your VPN uh, and then second is a uh, new attack vector into organizations uh, maybe through the employees home network uh, so training and communication is also a good idea just educating your users as to how a VPN works um, and, and the kind of different protections that are there and still there's that risk. Um, so, and then uh, don't, obviously another thing is don't expose your internal applications to the internet. Uh, do try to reduce load. Uh, some companies, the ar article mentioned that some companies have been doing cool. this. Um, Thanks. It's um, not a great practice. So. And apparently I somehow yeah. managed to close the Bruce Schneier article. Awesome. Um, well, in case I can't find it. Here it is. Um, so uh, Bruce Schneier had an, uh, just a quick blog rant about um, sort of the resurgence of the California data, data um, privacy law. Uh, so he comments on his article here that when the legislation kind of got rolled out, it actually got weakened a little bit because of a bunch of um, lobby groups pushing back at it. Um, and I guess now um, some folks have sort of like they took away some of the, the harsher penalties and some of the stronger parts of that piece of legislation. And he's saying that now um, 
a couple of groups are picking back up those other measures that were cut earlier and are trying to uh, get them pushed through um, so that, that you know, uh, they can kind of re-strengthen the law. And he was just saying, ultimately, this was it was probably a bad idea to cut them in the first place um, just for um, ballot measures and things like that. Um, the next article is somehow I broke it. Oh, I see why. Ha. Huh. So funny story. Uh, when I have to escape the underscores to make things work in um, Markdown, I guess it doesn't work when I copy and paste it. Anyways, uh, yeah, um, GoDaddy had a bit of a breach. Uh, I guess someone got in and must have uh, basically accessed some kind of identity file or something like that because GoDaddy was claiming that as a result of the breach, about 28,000 users' uh, SSH creds uh, were leaked. Um the the registrar is claiming that you know nobody's like actual accounts were compromised as a result of this but a bunch of creds might so you know kind of good practice would be to maybe go change your login creds for godaddy uh hopefully for ssh if you actually are hosting like remote servers or using key access anyways um but uh yeah uh that was that one uh, moving on adam it's your go uh, no, this is... I'll have to bring... I, like, close that one back, so I'll bring it back up at the end. Uh, it's the Krebs one. Okay, right. Uh, yes, so Krebs released an article kind of uh, describing how cyber criminals are weathering COVID-19 and how it's been impacting their operations. Uh, it's quite an interesting read. Um, so the pandemic uh, has provided a target-rich environment for fishers and scammers, um, mainly because a lot of people are really uh, have been looking for COVID-related news um, and those types of things. So it provides a, a good, tar unfortunately, a good target. Um, but it has impacted them in their in their abilities to monetize. So their costs, their costs, uh, and distributing their uh, supply chains have been heavily impacted. Um, so anything to do with physical ways, so um, such as like uh, the article mentions, like uh, reshaping meals. So basically, what they are is um, attackers will grab some credit cards and then they want to be able to transfer that um, digital asset into like a fi into their bank accounts or or uh, be able to buy something because um, that's what money's for but um and so what they use is they use uh, reshaping mules so you, these y these people usually live in uh, countries that are more tr more trusting like the u.s or europe uh, and then basically what they do is they receive the package and then they ship it off to uh, where the uh, the person that's trying to monetize it and it has the credit cards um, can receive the package um, so we there's also uh, been seeing that cyber criminals have been offering uh, discounts and giveaways as a way to kind of boost their credibility um, and increase kind of their traffic to their different various services that they provide in on the on the dark uh, markets. And uh, th another cool. side note, uh, the article uh, mentioned at the very also. end is like people have been questioning like the morality of like yeah the most users. exploited uh, vulns um, since twenty sixteen. So, yeah. U.S. government one? Okay, perfect. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so the government uh, shared a list of most exploited vulnerabilities since 2016 uh, to 2019. Um, the, and the Bureau released a, a, a short report, actually, just six pages, and they just outlined um, the most common vulnerabilities that are used. Um, and they're pretty blunt about why they did this. They did this um, to uh, force attackers to... Uh, develop new, continue to, continue to develop new tool chains. So um, a lot of the time, uh, APTs or advanced persistent threats will build out a tool chain and then they'll use it for multiple organizations. Or uh, and it depends on the scope. So sometimes it might be broad. Sometimes like uh, like any company that's running like Microsoft, which is a lot, or it could be very specialized, such as bank, we've seen like banking. Uh, banking being a popular one as well. So um, yeah, so they posted it. It's a it's a very short read um, and contains some uh, interesting uh, interesting uh, 
vulnerabilities. So the most popular one was Microsoft's object lin linking cool. um, embedding technology. So, so the next one is uh, uh, we've seen basically uh, just a notice, not really a news article that, um, you know, all the major uh, Las Vegas conferences, the cybersecurity ones and the um, hacking ones this year got sort of pushed online or canceled altogether. Um, so yeah, this was just on kind of DevCon's homepage. So they're advertising it as like DevCon safe mode so that you can basically watch all the talks for free from your home. Um, yeah, and that's about it. Um, so it should be interesting. I mean, it'll be great talks for free. There's probably going to be a lot of events running online for free as well. So, uh, keep an eye out for that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, uh, that's kind of it for that one. Um, Adam, back to you with the the We Leak data one. Right. So, um, We Leak. Uh, so there was a popular um, uh, site uh, that basically focused on uh, database breaches. So it was a. Forum where uh, people could discuss and also exchange and uh, exchange the sell of uh, databases that have been uh, um, compromised and uh, and copied. Uh, so the site contained re uh, activity relating to the exchange and exchange of stolen databases during data breaches or other or through other means. Uh, in April, the site mysteriously shut down without notice uh, and has led to several rumors. It just kind of went dark. And cyber intelligence firm uh, Symbale uh, found the database online um, and has validated that uh, it appears to be the, the real database. Um, and it's being sold on the dark web out of all places. So uh, a data leaking site sold their data, sold, uh, sold the data. So um, they, the company Cybill, um acquired the data and actually has uploaded uh, it to imbreach.com. So if if someone needs to, I'm sure none of us from from Sheridan uh, IS, but you can find it on imbreach.com. So. Uh, okay. So Nintendo. So there was a, a massive leak. Uh, so someone on 4chan uh, posted um, a lot of internal materials related to uh, past consoles, so the Wii U source code, GameCube console, and N64 console. The data dump contained technical documentation and source code used by various consoles, um, as mentioned. Uh, it's still unclear how they acquired the how they acquired the information, um, but Nintendo has a large emulator community that tries to bring past games to life. Um, and even though many people have said that there's no way that they could actually put this code into uh, emulation software, uh, it will definitely uh, be, yeah. Helpful, yeah. be helpful. Anyways, um, to <laughs> I'm going to jump on to my hack, next one. Uh, uh, so um, so Samsung yeah, uh, really discovered a vulnerability on their phones going back to models that had been out since like uh, 2014. I guess it was a custom like graphics format. It was this uh, Qmage uh, image format. And someone from Google's Project Zero realized that uh, um, basically, you know, by loading one of these image uh, images, you can kind of uh, basically try to compromise the device and, and take over that way. Um, so basically, they just rolled out a patch for it. Um, again, uh, it's scary because, you know, people can like, it doesn't really require user interaction, right? People can push you a message over MMS. Um, and at that point, you're just going to like load this uh, image and then you're going to be the victim of the um sort of the exploit so yeah um good that they're rolling out um uh, patch for that because every like android that samsung sold since 2014 is a hell of a lot of androids and uh yeah yeah cool you're Yep, and also they found a way to exploit it without actually, uh, so they can send a notification, uh, a text message without actually the phone ringing, 
which is uh, quite scary too. Um, so yeah. Uh, is this the mobile friends one? Okay, so there was a large data breach uh, for a major data breach for mobile friends. Um, so the breach occurred sometime in January 21st. Uh, the data set was for sale initially on uh, various hacker forums, uh, but now it appears to uh, being sh be shared on uh, public forums uh, for free. Um, and that's quite scary because it contains email address, phone numbers, dates of birth, uh, gender information, usernames, um, app website activity, um, but uh, probably just like how many times they've used it. Uh, it does not contain private messages, fortunately. Um, and also it contains hash password and, and it also contains uh, users hash passwords, uh, but in MD5. So um, it's basically plain text. Uh, so uh, they've also in within the data set, they've also uh, noticed that some users have on a on a dating app have used their corporate email addresses to sign up. Um, so like they found uh, people signed up from like large fortune uh, 1000 companies. So um, yeah, so definitely take a look and see if any uh, employees are using that and reset their passwords. Okay. Uh, so Chinese, uh, this is a Chinese phone brand one. Okay. So according to a uh, cybersecurity uh, researcher, um, so there was a bit of a back and forth between different uh, Chinese manufacturers. So um, Oppo and, oh shoot, I lost it. Oppo um, was already known to do this. Uh, yeah, Oppo and Realme and Huawei have already already come under fire for uh, logging users' um, uh, web traffic. Um, but uh, Xiaomi has also been found to to collect uh, browser data uh, from users, um, and there was a bit of a back and forth. So based on based on the researcher, like uh, he went and said, like, "Hey, you're tracking user uh, browser activity," and they said no, and then they said, and then he showed them proof, and then they're like, "Okay, maybe a little bit, but not in incognito mode," and then and then he went back and did some more, more digging, and then. He's like, no, actually, it is still logging. And they're like, okay, maybe a little, but it's mostly anonymous. And then kind of that's kind of where the story kind of dropped off. But it looks to be that that um, even in an in incognito mode, they still track anonymous uh, data. So, you know, if something's too if if something's too good to be true, chances are it probably is. So maybe maybe that's kind of how they're able to be competitive. Sure. Um, so the uh, Forbes uh, had an article, I don't know if other people report on this. Uh, basically, um, there's sort of like a middleman in the UK electricity market where um, they will uh, manage and facilitate payments between like providers and customers and all kinds of other stuff like that. Um, and what happened is uh, they kind of got a breach. Uh, right now, people suspect it might have been ransomware. Um, but anyways, a bunch of their internal systems went down. Uh, it should be noted though that like the attack and the effects weren't actually noticed on the UK electrical grid, just on like a payment facilitator who operates in that market. It's interesting because um, like, you know, maybe there's some speculation out there on is someone trying to pull a, you know, like a third party provider kind of attack whereby you compromise one of these uh, organizations and then maybe from there you try to pivot into the actual um what do you call it like the the actual uh electricity provider uh, yeah um so interesting um just so just worth noting that like maybe something like that um is being attempted we don't know i mean totally just speculating but anyway so that was the thing uh kind of worth noting so yeah uh here you go Like the, yeah, the client. Okay, uh, so the Google Authenticator got a major update. Uh, so, so previously when you were using Google Authenticator, the key is
restored on a device. So, so when you change devices or you you move from uh, device to device, um, you'd have to actually go into all every single uh, uh, service that you use the Google Authenticator and Okay, uh, and the last story is um, basically Google and Apple are working together to kind of build some um, like COVID uh, interaction tracing kind of program. And they both said that, hey, no matter what, we're not going to allow other apps to use this for like location tracking of people. Um, it's nice to know that they're actually thinking of these things ahead of time now um, because, you know, in the past Your, they wouldn't. Uh, um, the, you know, we'd always discover factor, that stuff or think about those use cases uh, after the fact, but now they're actually thinking about it, um, so you know, ahead of time before we actually, you know, uh, hear about the uh, privacy concerns and privacy yeah, issues yeah, and stuff like security. that. So, yeah, nice that they kind of made this pledge. Um, right, and I guess, uh, like, Adam, do you want to just... Uh, take a couple seconds to talk about that other article. I don't have it quite in the uh, in the list, but yeah. Um, just talk about it for a few seconds and then we'll hop over to the repo thing. Hello? Oh, maybe not. Okay. Uh, oh, did he leave? The... That's okay. Uh, I guess uh, I will go ahead and do the uh, repo rundown now since it's kind of time for that. Um, yeah. So uh, for this week's uh, GitHub repository, um, I picked this tool called um, PyAttack. Um, and it gets really annoying because you'll notice that the uh, A is missing in the word attack. Um, yeah. So that's kind of uh, weird whenever you start like writing code with this. Um, I ended up really putting the A in all the time and it was really confusing. Anyways, the idea is that this thing gives you programmatic access to the um, data sets from the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Um, it's, it's kind of a convenient, uh, really handy tool. Um, and the reason I want to touch on it is they just had a great big version update on this thing. So uh, it was worth talking about. It's by um, uh, a group called Swimlane and they do like security automation and orchestration and stuff like that. So the uh, link to the GitHub is right there. Um, so the author's description, uh, a lightweight uh, framework for MITRE ATT&CK. Uh, yeah, uh, it gives you access to the like enterprise data set, the pre-attack data set, and the mobile frameworks data sets. Um, it's really easy to install. It's just pip install pyattack, and then you can start playing with this library. Um, my whole TLDR, the whole project, um, it's kind of like a, an ORM-like object that contains all of the parsed MITRE data. So if you wanted to include all this data into like a presentation or into like you know an actual sim platform like if you basically wanted to include and, and work with this data programmatically rather than having to download the data set yourself load it into a database do all kinds of parsing and stuff like that and then start actually writing sql and querying the database um, these authors have taken it all and bundled it basically into a python object that you can ask um, for data and for fields on so yeah that's kind of how it works um, if you don't know what MITRE is, um, it's basically um, like an attack framework. The best way to describe it actually is visually, but here's like, there's the description off the MITRE site, but visually it's kind of um, across the top, this gray bar is like the phases of an attack, right? That someone would engage in. So like initial access, execution, persistence, and so on. And then the columns for those are the various techniques and methods that different groups would use. And if you click on any of these on the actual MITRE site, you get a drill down that talks about things like mitigations, different threat groups that have used these attacks and all kinds of other procedures and, and techniques and tools that are used to actually pull these attacks off. It's a really valuable data set. And so bundling and building that into code would be really neat because maybe you might be, you might, you know, see some like PowerShell activity and you might, might want to query this to find out, hey, is this in any way related to some of the threat actor stuff that we've seen, uh, which would be kind of neat. So the features of this um, GitHub repo, um, I kind of bolded the three uh, more interesting things. One, uh, it'll pull like logos from the actual thread groups, which is really neat. 
um because we all like logos if it doesn't have one it will draw an ascii logo for that thread group uh which is amazing um because it like it will show you the library later that it uses but like it just kind of comes up with an ascii art logo for that thread group if they don't have one assigned to them um it will allow you to search the data set for like commands um you know like actual like powershell commands and stuff uh kind of and um just giving you programmatic access to the data set which is ultimately the most important part so uh, Python dependencies that this thing needs to work, like that live in the requirements.txt file, obviously you need Python because it's a Python library. Um, so things like uh, it uses requests to actually query um, MITRE's GitHub repo to pull down the data. It uses Pendulum, which is a library for making date and time formatting really nice because date and time formatting is a pain in the ass. Um, PyFiglet, which basically is a Python version of Figlet, a command line tool that draws ASCII art. So this is how they're getting the ASCII art rendering of the various threat groups if they want to make one. PyYaml is just for parsing YAML configuration files. Pillow is something for working with uh, images and graphic handling. Again, just so they can like render the uh, logos. And Fire, which is a Python library that I like literally just learned about while I was reading this code base. It lets you turn like Python objects essentially into like command line tools so if you have a really cool project that has a bunch of functions and you just want to expose that as a command line tool as opposed to a python library this library lets you do that and it's awesome and i have like a, a like a screenshot of a demo at the end because it's freaking awesome um the organization of the repository looks something like this so at the the high level repo you know there's like docs and you can have it generate um, documentation for you and stuff, not super interesting. There's test code and stuff like that. There's the actual um, graphics and logos and stuff. Um, but in the root directory, there's this thing, the generated attack data, which is kind of neat. Basically every, on like a regular pulled basis, they pull this giant JSON file from the MITRE um, GitHub. Uh, which we'll see like the call to later. And it's like 25 megs of just straight JSON text that has this giant data set in it. Um, if we drill down into the actual application, which is this PyAttack folder here, um, we have actors, which is like a link to the um, graphics for those actors. Um, they're like the various threat actor groups. Um, enterprise, mobile, and pre-attack are kind of the three different data sets that you can access. I'm just going to talk about the enterprise one, but the all the code and the stuff that I described would be the same for both. Um, also in the sort of main folder for PyAttack, there's also main.py, which launches the CLI tool if you want to interact with this thing just on the command line. Um, there's attack.py, which gives you sort of the primary class that you instantiate when you're working with this thing. And there's this datasets.py that's actually responsible for pulling the data set from MITRE, which is neat. Um, inside the enterprise folder, and this is sort of duplicated for mobile and a pre-attack, but then you have um, like ORM or object relational mapping objects. So like you know, a Python class to represent the actor object and malware and mitigations and tactics and stuff like that. And the enterprise object is how we um, query and, and work with these various things. So, um, cause it's a little bit weird. I was just gonna, like I wrote up a quick example to show you how you might use this library in code if it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So in your Python script, you say, hey, from PyAttack import attack, um, attack equals uh, like an instance of this attack object here. And then for maybe for every actor in uh, attack dot enterprise data set dot actors. So basically loop over all the possible threat actors. If the word China appears in the actors list of potential countries they might be from, then print the actors ID and their name just for something to do. Like maybe you want to know, hey, what are all the threat actor groups that um, that they're tracking uh, from China right now? Right, um, and the output of that, if you run that script, would basically look like this. There's the ID, and there's the threat actor group, and this goes on and on and on. Um, the names get better, you know, later on, like Bronze Butler and Deep Panda and fun stuff like that. Um, another example of how you might use this code repo. Um, so again, we'll, we'll import attack. We'll create an instance of the attack object. Like this is always the first two lines. And now maybe I want some more details. So again, um, for each actor in the list of actors, if they're um, a Chinese threat actor group, um, then for all of that actor's known tools, print me the actor name and then say is known to use such and such a tool. Right? Like I'm just printing out um, data and the correlations and stuff, but you know, you could use this to query for things that you're seeing in your environment and stuff like that. Um, so the output from something like this is like Deep Panda is known to use ping, which is a hilarious threat actor tool. Um, or 
Kei Cheng is no Kei Cheng is known to use Mimi Cats um, stuff like that. So it generates this huge long list of tools that they're all known to use. And for some of the tools and the techniques, you can also like list the mitigations and things, um, which is uh, sort of cool. Um, so a couple of the core files, um, the main stuff. Uh, there's main.py, which is neat. This is um, this is all the code that turns this thing into just a regular command line tool that you can use to query the data set. Um, attack.py, which is in the, sort of the main root there. Um, basically, it is this class called attack. Um, it has a bunch of like local variables for things like tactics, techniques. These are going to be populated later on with lists of data that we pull from the MITRE data set. Um, so when you make an instance of this attack object, it calls init, which is like its constructor, its instantiation method, and it goes off and it calls attack data sets, or it creates an instance of attack data sets and populates that locally. So what happens there? Well, how do we get all this data? Um, so on the data set, what happens? We actually just we, uh, have the encoding URL of the MITRE, like for the, um, in this instance, like the enterprise data. And what happens when you create an instance of this attack data set? We and we fetch that data and we're gonna load it um, down here. Kind of what happens is if we're looking at the enterprise data, uh, we say um, get MITRE JSON and then we uh, go off and fetch all the enterprise data. And um, we'll show you how it does that. It basically says, uh, you know, based on that URL that we had, uh, it says requests.get URL. So it will go and it will fetch that data from the uh, MITRE GitHub URL right here, um, convert it to JSON, store it in this object, and return it. That would end up going back here and getting stored locally in your instance of this giant attack data set object. So that's kind of the work of it fetching the data. Right now it's just a giant JSON file stuck in this object. Okay. Um, also, it does give a copy locally on your machine. You can kind of catch the data so you don't have to it to GitHub every time. So it will also output it to a local JSON file. Um, in the, in the attack file after we've created our instance of the attack data set say I want to say you know attack.enterprise uh, like I did in my code example right what happens uh, when you say dot enterprise it loads the data um, where it kind of goes and it calls this load data function all that does um, oh no my screen's like cutting off a little bit there we go um, it goes off and it calls that MITRE method that we saw before and it just returns that giant JSON file. Right now we haven't parsed it or done anything interesting with it. We're just like passing around this huge 25 meg JSON file hoping to like parse it and make it useful at some point. So eventually we're gonna return some enterprise object that has that data in it. But then we say dot actors on the end. So once we kind of drill down into the file, um, then it eventually finds its way down into sort of this loop where it will, um, you know, if there are, if we haven't populated the list of actors already, uh, we will iterate through that JSON file looking for various objects. And if so, we'll basically use sort of this, mm, this object here to parse out and represent as an actor and we'll slowly populate this list of actors. So this thing uh, is just a class of things like actors and malware and, and threats um, that basically pulls out all the individual properties from that file so it grabs the ID and attributes and, and names and aliases and lists of tools um, and that's kind of how this thing works it mostly just pulls a big JSON file and then depending on what you ask for it checks to see if it's parsed it already and if not it sits and it iterates um, over those things extracting the data from this giant JSON string and populating it into local fields that you could then access in your code um, that's some of how it does the the JSON parsing. It gets a little bit nasty because like for s in p if s or like if p at s is miter attack, then get the actual field registers. It gets a little bit messy, but ultimately that's all that's happening. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to point out is I said you could use this thing rather than like a Python library. You could just use it as a command line utility. Um, so this is how you would do that. Um, so you would write yourself, you know, like a little whatever dot py file. Um, I import that fire library from PyAttack import attack. Um, again, we create an attack object. And I just say fire dot fire attack. Um, at that point, I can run this. And if I say dash dash help, it'll show me all of the possible commands I can run. Um, so I found out that one of them, you know, the same thing I was doing in the actual Python script earlier, I can say, hey, show me for the enterprise data set, show me all the act actors. And it'll just dump that as a JSON file for me, which is amazing. But I could also say enterprise tools or enterprise 
um, techniques or enterprise actors techniques and it would do the same thing I was doing programmatically but like as a command line tool so if you wanted to generate and feed this data into some other tools that's neat uh, I guess the only thing to mention is the output JSON file is a little bit ugly and uh, it needs cleanup if you want to use it for anything else um, yeah, as with anybody that wants them. Uh, it's not like a, programmatically, it's not a super complicated library. Um, it's, it's more of a convenient thing than anything else. So if you wanted to work out how to get access to this stuff programmatically, um, you can do that. Yeah, thanks.